Hey, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning, wherever you happen to be. Uh, welcome to Conversations on Retail. Uh, my name is Mike Grain, and we're going to do yet another series in our focus on on-shelf availability. And we're going to actually go back and combine a couple of topics together because on-shelf availability plays an important role in making sure you've got what the customer wants. But we have talked about RFID and food before, leveraging RFID technology to make sure you have the freshest product and uh, delivered to your customer, uh, number one. But number two, we've also talked about a concept that GS1 has called Sunrise 2027. And we're going to talk about how they actually potentially fit together in a big way. My my uh, my guest is a returning to the scene of the crime, Jonathan Gregory. Uh, Jonathan, you want to uh, unmute and give us a little bit of background about you and your uh, your history? Hey, Mike, good to be with you here today. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's great to be with you again. Uh, so a little bit of my history, yes, I've been with GS1 US for about five years. And uh, before that was deploying RFID solutions for 13 years in the aerospace and in the retail environments. <clears throat> and, um, even before that, dealing with uh, IT systems, uh, the largest ERP system in the world at, the, at its time, deploying that out, dealing with uh, shop floor labor collection and the like. So that's kind of the professional career. I am a dad, a father of four, so I like to throw in a, a dad joke here or there. Um, so uh, potentially uh, some corny jokes on the way as well. So, <laughs> All right. I'm going to put you on the spot because I didn't tell you I was yeah. going to ask you this question. Give us yeah. your hobby. What's your best hobby? Oh, man. Uh, so the one that I, I like most, is it, it's the most distinct, is winter hiking. I will take my son out into uh, the Adirondacks or you know some guys out, uh, some buddies, and I will go out and try and survive for a couple of days in the woods in the deep snow. And it always makes me appreciate my couch for the whole rest of the year. So that's <laughs> that's that's the biggest hobby, yeah. Is this the whole you wear the shoes that look like tennis, oh, yeah. you know, tennis rackets? Oh, yeah, yeah. And all that no shoes and layered up oh, and goodness. pitching a tent in the snow and all that jazz. Just can't beat it. Uh, it's okay. It's okay why? The, the obvious question is why? Because somebody else said, Oh, I love to run marathons. I go, Why? Why would you <clears> because run 26 it's there. miles? <laughs> <laughs> it takes you, it completely, talk about a vacation, Mike, right? It completely takes you out of the, the day day to day and put okay. you in a state of being if you will so i have to survive here you i have to focus have to on survive. the moment uh, well, <laughs> you, it's could also, combine, you could buy those things you could say i love my son but i'm going to take him out in the, in the woods and leave him and see if i can make it back and this is called survival training from day yeah i wouldn't leave him but but it also <laughs> forms certain bonds between people like when you suffer together you know <laughs> you, you never forget it you know so it's a good time <laughs> Oh my goodness! I've never, you know, I've known you. I've known you probably for probably about five years, and I never knew that about you. So I'm glad I asked. You that about you. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell it for so you've been at so you've been at GS1 for five years. For those yes, people who don't know, GS1 is what and why are they important to the industry? Help us understand a little bit more about what GS1 does. Yeah, great question, Mike. So, uh, so about fifty years ago, the UPC barcode was invented, right? And uh, you know that was because long checkout lines and grocery stores. Well, somebody has to govern the standards and the data so that, you know, brand A and brand B don't have the same barcode value on them. So you, you need a, a neutral third party GS1 US is a, or GS1 is a, a not-for-profit uh, organization that uh, ensures that uh, common standards are applied. So we govern a whole system of in industry commerce standards so this spans from you know identifying products or locations or business entities or shipments um, to the the realm of capturing that data so the the standards for barcode symbologies that relate uh, certainly the RFID standards so uh, GS1 maintains the the technical standards that undergird and power the RFID technology. Mm. Uh, and then the share, so ID capture and then the sharing of that data. So uh, GS1 maintains the standards for EDI, so purchase orders, advanced shipment notices, things like that. Um, the GDSN is a global data synchronization network that uh, provides product attributal data. So it's a way of getting to a common picture and understanding of uh, of product attributes, you know, what's the size, dimension, uh, you know, that information, net weight, product image, you know, that that type of information mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, really necessary for industry commerce. Um, 
So uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about GS1 is that it is a global federated network. So I'm with GS1 US, the United States instance, if you will, of GS1. But there's a GS1 China, Japan, Brazil, et cetera. There are over, I believe, 116 country-specific GS1 organizations. They're all not-for-profit or government agencies. Hmm. And so what this does is it gives you a global industry commerce uh, infrastructure, if you will, that ensures kind of these basic elements uh, of business vocabulary, if you will, are available and leveraged. Uh, and every day, over 10 billion uh, just when barcodes are scanned. So pretty intense. That's awesome. Yeah. And I've been around the industry to know the pain of not leveraging GS1 standards. When I start, first started, I was with Procter & Gamble. When I first started working with Walmart. We wanted to do this thing called continuous replenishment, where literally we would get orders in DC levels of inventory and we'd build the orders for Walmart and actually ship the product. Well, we did it in a proprietary standard because there was no standard for that at that time. So I'm not going to tell you how old that it was. It was a long time ago. And they wanted to run to reapply for Target and Kroger, and Target and Kroger wanted it in a different format. And we quickly said, if we do this for 50 customers, we've got 50 different ways of getting orders and invoice information into our system. Stop. we got to do something else. So it was right about the time that GS1 came up with, hey, we are going to create uh, EDI, Electronic Data Interchange Standards, for sharing product information and invoicing and purchase order, et cetera. Now everybody's on one standard. You don't have to have a different set of standards to work with different retailers, which is incredible. So thank you for your hard work. It, it's sort of it, it's it's sort of like the DNA of the body. It, when it works, you take it for granted. And when it doesn't work, you get really, really sick and you don't know why. And that's you know, if you don't have yeah. the standards and the rules, everybody kind of plays by their own rules. And that's that becomes very costly, right? Yeah, it works best when you don't really have to think about it, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's just, it's exactly. just there in the background. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So so the, the focus of this channel is really on-shelf availability, and we're going to talk a little bit about on-shelf availability and specifically food freshness. I think you've got some pretty interesting concept about some of the things that are going on. Forget about GS1 for a second. Just the, the challenges of food and food waste, et cetera, it's a big deal. People, we throw away a lot of product that we probably don't want to throw away. So walk us through what some of the opportunities in the in the food waste area are. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So um, every year, according to the uh, United Nations Environment Program report from uh, the year 2021, uh, about, a, about a billion, over a billion in metric tons <laughs> of food is wasted. Uh, and wow. they, actually, the report breaks it down uh, by how much of that waste is, is uh, contributed by food service and how much by retail. So when you combine that, you see that 363 million tons of food is wasted from retail and food service alone every year, which is uh, mm -hmm. pretty incredible. Um, so, so there's a huge opportunity, I mean, uh, in the trillions, if you will, uh, opportunity to to solve this problem with standardization and technology, right? In order to, you just reduce that and you have a huge win. Everybody wins when you reduce food waste. There's so many kind of implications and ripple effects of that waste, be it um, environmental impact and, and costs uh, to businesses, um, impacts on uh, customer safety, you know, food safety and whatnot. Um, I was just thinking um, when I was uh, traveling back, I was in an airport, about a month ago, and uh, I'd, I'd, it wasn't a quick serve restaurant. It was a kind of a sit down place, uh, but I'd ordered a, a yogurt, you know, and it was like a, one of those granola yogurt kind of combo things. And it had yeah. a little like expiration, like a, a sticker on it. And the sticker had been scratched right at the month. Uh, and, and it was old. It was a month old. Uh, oh but gosh. but somebody had, had kind of scratched the top of the sticker. And, and I, I was like, this is... I mean, I could still eat it, but I was like, no, mm -mm, this isn't. Oh, gosh. And it was it was such an anecdote because I had just come to, from a meeting talking about food safety and expiration. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and now Jonathan Gregory's in the hospital because of botulism for three weeks. Yeah, right. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, my yeah, God. It, tons of waste. And, and also, you know, the regulatory elements that are drivers, right? So FISMA Rule 204, I think, uh, yep. you know, your audience probably is aware of this, right? So the the, the requirement to uh, trace the movement, the, the batch lot, the um, the origin of where you got this, um, 
you know, this item, uh, when you receive items, when you transform them and when you ship them uh, and be able to turn that information around very quickly. Um, so that's a interesting driver, but I would say with regards to RFID, that is one of many drivers. It's not only from a regulatory perspective, there's all that opportunity with regards to waste reduction. Um, and then just to, not to go on too long, but, but inventory management, just the kind of the blocking and tackling of inventory management, so lowering your safety stock, which which lowers your working capital, uh, reducing labor, specifically reducing really <clears throat> monotonous things that somebody, oh, I want to have to go count this thing, um, dealing with product pairings or uh, dynamic demand creation. So being able to offer limited time offers when you see uh, excess inventory to be able to move that uh, digitally, even quick serve restaurant, digital signboards, things like that, the, the ability to, to do those. There's just a really exciting way when you connect the, uh, the the serialized data that you can receive in to action to respond to it. Yeah, well, I'm looking at your slide here. Let's let's double click on just, just a little bit before we get into the solution. So yeah. you've got 5% of all food service is waste and 2% is retail waste. Okay, so yeah. it's 2024, Jonathan. It seems to me you ought to be able to pick strawberries in a field and get it all the way to a customer table without throwing it away. What are some of the major levers of why this food waste occurs in the supply chain? The why of food waste, you know that that's a big question, Mike. And uh, okay. uh, but, but it's gonna it's gonna lead into the solutions that you're coming up with about just knowing, for example, what is what what case of strawberries should I put on the shelf? There's three of them here. Do I just right. grab the first one or, or, or what? So I'm, I'm looking yeah, yeah. for what are some of the causes of waste that you guys put RFID standards in place to solve? Yeah. So think of seventeen. 17- year old John Gregory here working at a, a quick serve restaurant or a restaurant, right? Yep. 17 year old John Gregory goes in at say 4.30 in the morning to go prep some material uh, for, for the next day to, to wash some lettuce or to do what have you, right? 17 uh, year old John Gregory <clears throat> may not be the best, uh, most reliable person to make sure that the, the right item is picked to be checked for, say, is it recalled or uh, is this one uh, has the the newest or latest expiration date, if you will, um, and so really part of this is the the human factor of managing uh, the the picking. And so if you can automate and provide mechanisms that uh, that mistake proof those processes, uh, that's one big big reason. Uh, in seventeen, John Gregory could be in a distribution center, and so uh, potentially picking something that's going to expire. You know, a week from now, when something next to it is going to expire, you know, a day from now or what have you. Yeah. Um, so part of it is just the 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 flow, and really, it's the availability of data. Um, another point is that <clears throat> oftentimes we've we've had anecdotes where back end systems data. You know, if if I generate data and I share it with a trade partner and it goes through multiple systems, guess what? You know, systems have vulnerabilities at times where uh, the data can be inadvertently uh, corrupted in some way, right? And what we found is that the barcode data is uh, a shining example of great data quality uh, because the barcode is encoded at that point of manufacture yep. and it's really indelible. It's almost like a blockchain in a sense, in the sense that it's it's not widely distributed, but it's right there and it can't be changed. You can't like put another line in the barcode and, and change its value. Yeah. Um, and so the reliability of that is really uh, substantial. And yet the barcode doesn't offer a non-line of sight. You have to, say, depalletize, uh, say, for example, uh, uh, meat, right? Uh, there are many of examples where distribution centers receive a pallet of, of meat uh, cases, and they have to depalletize simply to barcode scan uh, each case, and then they repalletize it. Yeah. Uh, so they did that just to get the data where the RFID technology offers you non-line of sight. So allows you to, to capture that data and reduce that labor. Got it. So talk, talk to us a little bit about in the food versus apparel. Apparel is a serialized item. So it's the UPC. I, I call it the G10 and the serialization. There's additional data you can put in that provide attributes for food type products specifically. So talk to us a little bit about how GS1 is working standards that allow that to occur. Yeah, Mike, the, 
the interesting thing I want to harken back to one of the first calls I was on when I joined GS1 US about five years ago, connected a major leading retailer, uh, you know, apparel retailer <clears throat> with a major leading quick serve restaurant. So I won't name names, but right. Um, right. And in that call, the, the retailer, because apparel was first, right. Apparel has, has deployed RFID yep. uh, in large part and uh, has seen great success with it. And so it was interesting to hear these executives who really were kind of the glue of, of allowing uh, these folks to, to talk and to hear them talk about, Hey, here are all the benefits we see. And we could see the quick serve restaurant group getting excited like wow well, we could really use this right but it begs the question what's the difference between apparel and general merchandise mm -hmm. and food for example or pharma right and that is the date uh, the the velocity of of the of the products um, are moving much faster and you have to manage that date so it's a different core business requirement you know a sweater is not really expiring uh, but you know a, a case of tomatoes is right <clears throat> and so the challenge was uh, the existing structures for the data structures were great for apparel, but they didn't really serve the needs of food service mm -hmm. in that they didn't put the date value into the RFID tag. You say, well, I, I can just put that on a cloud, can't I? Well, you can, but when you look at how uh, fractured, uh, if that's the right word, how diverse the the um, the food industry is, you know, uh, uh, the Forest 500 nonprofit group had... Um, had looked at a burger and fries and packaging in Europe and they evaluated and they said that the content of that could have come from up to 75 different supply chains. Wow. Right? So it's, it's mind blowing, right. To think of mm. the number of places <laughs> that, that, that food is sourced from uh, the shape of the, uh, the, the food industry is different than apparel. Like, you know, a, a, a retailer might know, okay, they might have their own distribution center and they might have their own, even factories, or they have a series of national brands, and it's it's a short list. Whereas in the food space, you have a whole lot of farms all over the globe, focusing all that product into uh, the distributors. And so, really, the distributors are kind of those those key points. Uh, more so, you're buying from a distributor than from a farm, as a quick serve restaurant or what have you. Um. So, so the diversity of the of the number of participants suggests that. You know, putting the data in the cloud could be incredibly difficult to do, to be able to get to quickly. Um, but if I can put this core data into the RFID tag itself, then that uh, that allows me to manage the product kind of on the edge and, uh, and I believe, makes the solutions scalable. Yeah. Well, the, the other practical example is you get in environments that are very, very difficult to get any kind of connectivity from an internet standpoint. So I'm in a freezer cooler, which is a complete metal box. Good luck getting a Wi-Fi signal, right? So you have to have some of that offline on the devices itself because you're never going to get to the cloud if you're in the back of a cooler trying to do a, which one of these should I mark down, right? Yeah, so yeah exactly. Great point. Great point. Yeah, and, and along those lines, like a cooler example or a distribution center conveyor. Right where yeah. uh, we we've seen this demonstrated where hey I can I can on the edge that conveyor system can read the expiration date of the RFID tag and divert uh, any item that's closer to expiry to, to be consumed mm -hmm. more quickly for example and that logic doesn't require a call up to a cloud where hey where where might the data be where where's my data source it's the data is right there in the moment and responding yeah. Well, maybe maybe help help unpack for us. For we'll go a little bit deeper in the tech because I think it's important. But give us the structure of what a normal apparel tag information would look like. Right, information that's actually in a tag versus the kind of information you'd have for that same thing for a food product. Is because I think there's some similarities, but there's some additional things that are available for food. Right? Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to do that, Mike. So. Uh, the SG1096, not to geek out on you here, right? Uh, that, that is the encoding scheme, very widely used, very widely used. You go into a, a retailer, a big box store, um, just about anywhere that you're reading an RFID tag, there's a very, very uh, high usage of this SG1096 uh, encoding scheme. What does the encoding scheme encode? It encodes the G10 the global trade item number, which is the same data that is encoded in the UPC barcode or the EAN barcode if you're in Europe, right? So you have your G10 and your serial number, right? Um, now, 
what that allows is the G10 contains, just like your UPC barcode, and contains a GS1 company prefix, which means that you have a licensed company identifier. So you have a, a globally unique product described, and then you have a globally unique product instance when you serialize that. You have um, this particular you know, shirt, right? That I that I pick up uh, has a unique identity. No other um, item in the world has that same serialized identity. Okay, yep. um, so that works really well for apparel. Uh, but when we contrast that to what do I need for so, food? So let me stop you for yeah, just yeah. a second. And, and going sure. back to our original standards example, this particular yep. format can you be used ubiquitously across all the retailers: Walmart, Target, Macy's, whoever's doing RFID. They can read that same information. They don't have to have a different scheme for the their retailer, right? Exactly. And like I said at the beginning, like GS1 US or GS1 is all over the world, right? Right. So you don't have to be just in the US to read an SG1096. You're going to read it anywhere in the globe. So you're going to go to Europe. You're going to go uh, to the Far East, to Africa, and you're going to read the same data structure, uh, which is really, really helpful. So it's this common language uh, applied. Yeah. But, but back to your point, you need some additional information in the food part of the business like date. So walk us through how does that change when you move from this for pre predominantly general merchants and apparel to, look, he's got a slide that describes it. What, what am I <laughs> so, <laughs> so happy. happy. I, I didn't know how technical we wanted to go. So I'm going to I'm going to jump right in here, Mike. Okay, so no so you, you open the door. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is great. Come on, walk so you, in. All right, man. So so. Uh, uh, so the DSG10 plus, that is the encoding scheme instead of the SG1096. That is the encoding scheme for uh, food space, right? So so this is two examples of two different tags using this DSG10 plus encoding. I'll walk us through this, right? So uh, this is the nerdy stuff, right? So, so I'm just going to back up a tiny bit. An RFID tag is basically sending you a signal. Like you, you say, hey, tag, tell me who you are. And the tag says, okay. And it gives you a, a amplitude modulated signal back. So you get a big wave for one and a little wave for a zero, right? And so each one and zero is big and little waves that come back. And a reader is going to use GS1 standards to interpret those ones and zeros and, and make sense of them. And here is the gory details of exactly what that is. So my first eight bits, my first eight ones or zeros tell me, ah, this is a DSG10 plus encoded tag. I know what to expect next, right? So I know it's a product and I know this is the format. Uh, the next bit here says, am I giving you extra information beyond the core information that's required? In this top example, no, there's a zero here. In the bottom example, yes, there is extra information, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the, the next value is a filter, which in this case is indicating uh, a case, but you could have a point of sale item a filter value or a unit load or pallet or what have you. So the filter allows me to to have a, a distinction to be able to say, hey, I'm only looking for point of sale items here. Don't give me the other information or vice versa. Uh, the next two, uh, because it's a DSG twin plus, then I have to have a date. And so I'm saying, well, what kind of date? Is it a, a production date? Is it an expiry date? A best buy date, right? Those types of that that choice of what kind of date is indicated here by this date indicator followed by the actual date value, um, YYMMDD, you know, uh, right, year, month, day uh, format, followed by the G10. So just like the SG1096, except um, it's formatted a little more simply, uh, right? It's, it's, uh, it's in one string instead of having to use like an algorithm to put it together. Uh, but I have my product identifier here. And then following that is a encoding indicator and length indicator, which is really describing the serial number that's to come. And so I'm saying, I'm about to give you an uppercase hex a decimal value that's eight characters long, and here it is, right? And so uh, what I've done is I've captured this information that really, that it's a product, uh, that uh, I have a particular date, G10 and serial number. And I've done that in 128 bits. And let me just say why that, why I call that out. 128 bit tags are very widely available. Once you get over 128 bit tags, at least as of the time of this recording, then you don't have as many uh, chips available. They're they're definitely available. They're definitely out there, but um, you're outside of what I would typically call like a commodity space. And so that's your business decision: is you can add more data, but then um, there might be an, a cost associated with that. 
Uh, so just to round this up, so the first tag I've gone through, right? So 128 bits, I have my G10, my date, and my serial. Uh, the second tag um, here also includes a batch lot. And so we can see the same data structure is just that the AIDC indicator uh, says, yes, I have more data. And then this next line is showing I have application identifier 10, which is a batch lot. And again, a coding and length indicator saying, I'm giving you a num numeric value that's six characters long, and here it is. Um, so that's the, the gory details of how that's done, but really that's uh, so important to the industry to be able to encode this data. And this is um, the, this is part of the TAG Data Standard 2.0, which was released in August of 2022, which is really the most substantial change to the um, to the TAG Data Standard in over a dozen years. So some major effort, a major focus uh, within industry, really focused on enabling food uh, to 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 uh, build interoperable and future-proof solutions that will really truly scale globally instead of being kind of confined based on a uh, limited data that's available. So, so give me uh, three different tags. I've got a piece of apparel that's just a regular SG10. It's a 96-bit SG10. Then I've got a, a tag one that you've got here, which has extended attributes. That's 128. And then I've got a tag two with the bigger, which is 164. Do I, as a retailer, have to have different hardware and software capabilities to read this in? Do I have to convert everything over to this new format? Are we backwardsly compatible? Help help me think through that as a retailer. Yep. So the same hardware, same hardware to to, to read the tags because uh, the SG ten ninety six isn't the only encoding scheme. There are other higher uh, memory encoding schemes that exist, and the same hardware that supports this. G296 supports those other uh, higher memory. So you're not limited in any way. The system of standards and the, and the error protocol are, are all such that uh, there's no impact to your physical hardware. It's simply when you get the bitstream back, it's your software that interprets uh, okay. the bitstream. Uh, uh, that software has to be upgraded. But the cool thing is this is a standard. It's a global standard. So you're not making something that's proprietary that's going to kind of expire and you have to maintain uh, and and enter and you know, your trade partner doesn't know what you're doing. You're simply upgrading uh, this um, interpretive framework uh, to the newest standard. And so uh, that uh, the entire industry is going to have that capability. So that's something that uh, GS1 Global Office provides actually a software library uh, that can be used uh, within IT systems to, to do that conversion as well. So it, it uh, makes the lift a lot easier. All right, for those of the the audience that are about to check out, because we're all talking bits and bytes thing, let me let me take it back up to the business level. So, if I'm a major a, a major retailer, let's, let's leave the quick service restaurant for just a minute, because this is really about on shelf availability. Hmm. I can think of two different kind of use cases. One of them where you manufacture the product in a store. Maybe it's a bakery. Hey, I'm baking bread, right? Okay. Okay. So what exactly, uh, let's talk about that specific example. That would be a retailer that's putting a tag on that bread. What are the kinds of things that they could do with that? Obviously, we know the on-hand accuracy adjustments, but what are the other things that gives that this new capability that allows you to do? Yeah, uh, so by encoding that data into the RFID tag, you can also have a 2D barcode, I could say a QR code that you read at point of sale as well which is really a powerful synergy between the two. Um, first talking about in the store and then beyond that. So for okay. in the store, I can say, hey, I'm I'm now searching for items in my store that are going to expire tomorrow, right? Or have already expired. And I can do that very efficiently because the something I haven't mentioned, because I don't want to go too nerdy on you, but the over the air protocol, the way that readers to tags communicate has also been updated. Now you don't have to implement that update, but the latest version of that protocol allows you to say, hey tags, uh, only only you guys, only the guys that are um, expiring tomorrow, just, just respond to me and no other tags will respond. You think about how efficient that is when you're surrounded by RFID tagged items to only have the tags that you're looking for respond and identify themselves is a really powerful kind of infrastructure advancement there. Um, so you have the in-store uh, visibility, if you will, and capability. And this could be both from a handheld perspective or from a gateway perspective, um, but also the point of sale. So now 
I don't have to have an RFID reader at point of sale. Uh, I just scan that 2D barcode and I'm able to say, oh, this item, this specific item with this date information has been sold. Great. Like I've now decremented my inventory in a precise way. Um, and if I have, even if I'm cycle counting and I know, well, I have some items over in this part of the store and other items in that part, I know, well, I pulled this item that was over in that part of the store and I might replenish to it or have that more uh, specific location awareness based on that serialization. But it, you go beyond the point of sale. Now the consumer, and the consumer could do it before or after point of sale, could point their phone at the QR code and, and you can tell them a story, right? You can engage the consumer in a certain way in a, a variety of ways. And uh, so the consumer can can learn more about the, maybe somebody wants to check for an allergen after the fact or or, or order another one or, or what have you, right? Uh, or heaven forbid there's a recall or something like that. Um, there's that capability built into that platform, that digitally enabled uh, platform that's there. Got it. So let me let me make sure I got this right, because I, I think I'm tracking with you. So scenario yeah. one in the grocery store, I bake a loaf of bread. I slap just a regular label on it. And I put it out there for a customer to buy it. Every morning, I got to go through and look at every single date and every single boat loaf of bread to go, is that has to get marked down? Because they usually mark it down before they toss it. But there's a markdown process, mark it down for a reduced sale. They usually say, I bake too much, so here's an opportunity. But however they want to market that. And then the second one is, okay, that's now out of date. It's expired. I have to toss it. That's today's manual process. What you're saying with this is I put an RFID tag in that label. So there's no additional work by the store. They're still putting a label on. It just has to be RFID. They can use the cycle counting to literally find that and adjust on hand so it has the same level of accuracy that we're seeing in apparel and general merchandise. But I can also use it to go, hey, there are three loaves of bread that need to be marked down. And here's where they are. Just talk to me, three loaves of bread that need to be marked down instead of all of you talking to me. Is that all? That's right. Now, Absolutely. Yeah. And now, I can, I can you, use kind of, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You linked it into 2027. So let's take that a little bit farther. We don't have RFID readers at most point of sale. Right. So, so what did you, what were you talking about the 2D barcode at point of sale that could actually help that process as well? Yeah. Great question. Uh, so Sunrise 2027 is the GS1 US initiative to enable the 2D barcode scanning at point of sale okay. across the entirety of the com uh, country. And so this is a major effort. We're engaged with uh, lab testing and with the hardware manufacturers, and uh, it is a core focus of the organization to enable that to happen. Uh, and this is what industry needs and, and demands out of um, uh, out of you know this forward progress is we need more information, more product information encoded into the barcodes. We also have like, you know, our, our products are kind of like race cars. They're covered in logos and barcodes, right, <laughs> and identifiers. And this this intent here is to uh, simulate that, bring that down into one identifier. The power of it with something called GS1 Digital Link enables that one barcode to not only have a rich set of data, like the, the expiration date or batch lot or that type of information above and beyond the product identifier, but it also allows a web uh, resolvable address. So it allows you to uh, provide product information and engage consumers in a direct way. So it's more than just the point of sale, but Sunrise 2027 strictly focused, strictly defined is really about the point of sale uh, and that capability uh, to read. Now it's not sunset 2027. You can still read a bark, a, you know, UPC one dimension barcode, uh, but the intent is to phase away from that. And so it starts by turning on the capability to read those 2D barcodes. All right. So let's, let's play that part out. In addition to knowing what I have at a high level of accuracy. And when I leave for my first shift at 430, I know there are three loaves of bread that right now, tomorrow morning have to be marked down. What you're saying is while I'm spending time with my family, those particular loaves of bread could be bought at a register. That unique UPC, G10, and serial number is now left the building. When I come in, I may not have anything to mark down because I know specifically the three loaves of bread that need to be marked down tomorrow are no longer in the building. They were sold. Is that that's true? Kind of the idea? That's true. As well as let's say let's say you miss it. Let's say you have a markdown or you have a, uh, 
uh, expired loaf of bread and a consumer picks it up, right? And they go to the point of sale. The point of sale is going to say, sorry, buddy, I can't sell this to you. It's expired. Wow. Right? So so it's, it puts that intelligence or the consumer could use their own uh, phone uh, natively, right? Just use the camera app, just like we use with other QR codes and it yep. can give them the same information. So if they take, I don't think, you know, bread necessarily gets recalled. Maybe it does, you know, like bakery bread, Good. but, Good. but, uh, <laughs> but, but in certain cases, yeah, maybe, you know, uh, but you know, somebody hears about a recall, they can go to their refrigerator and point their phone at the QR code in the products in the refrigerator to say, okay, has anything here been recalled as well? So, so it allows that ongoing interactivity. Let's say a regulation comes into play where I need to um, provide more information about a, a certain element of a certain product, right? Um, in that regulation, I can conform to that regulation through that digital platform without having to change my product packaging as well, right? Wow. So it's, a, it's really powerful, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I can I can imagine, you know, having having the fortune to both be on the manufacturer side with Procter and Gamble and then the Walmart side. I can imagine product recalls are usually take it all off the shelf. I don't care where it came from. Take every little bit of it because we don't want the risk. When the reality yeah. is there was just one lot that was bad, but we end up pulling it all off and, and and you know, probably throwing it away because we just don't want to take the risk. But we literally could potentially go just this lot number needs to come off the shelf. Everything else. OK, that's fascinating. Yeah, the cost of recall is huge. It has a big impact on uh, brand erosion and on yeah. uh, the even viability of some businesses or markets um, and knowing where did these where did these items go? So a quick serve restaurant operator shared with me that, uh, you know, they have a recall. Well, uh, in certain cases, they have a, a large list of potential destinations, potential stores that this recalled, uh, these recalled items went to, but they don't, they don't have without RFID, they don't have the precision to understand which stores. So now they have to literally visit each store, say 75 stores, instead of the three stores that actually receive these items, they have to physically go visit, or sometimes they even have to shut down the registers to say, this is serious enough. We can't allow any sales until this has occurred. Um, so it's incredibly inefficient um, to yeah. deal with that. So you have a, a precision recall has a, a huge business benefit. Wow. Yeah. Well, here's here's another use case, and this is not a food related use case, but the other part of that is there's a lot of retailers out there, and I'm just going to call out Macy's, Joe Cole, and the great work he's doing in the asset protection space. Mm -hmm. And what they're trying to do is compare what left the store versus what through went through a register. Today, it's I sold these G10s, so the UPCs, and I'm trying to match those against what serialized items left the store. So you sort of got a one to many kind of thing. Now in the future, if we get this 2D barcode, which has to be serialized on a package, that gives us the ability to say that item without trying to use point of sale at registers, because that that has challenges with overreads and underreads and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yep. And just more hardware at the at the register that's going to cost the retailer money. We can actually read the serialized item that was sold versus the serial items that are leaving the store and take whatever action they choose choose from them, including if somebody does take something like that and just track this through and then they return it the next day and say, I want my money back. We happen to know that that particular item never went through a register and it left the store. They may be a different conversation with the customer than here's your money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Loss prevention has been, uh, it's grown a lot in a last yeah. couple of years and, and yeah. the um, the focus within the industry, especially because we've seen loss prevention or, or you know, organized retail crime at work and, yep. and uh, maybe less organized as well. Uh, what's interesting is also the, so I totally agree with what you're saying. And and that that's a very powerful thing. The, the power of serialization, how does that apply to loss prevention, right? And so being able to see what did I sell, like you said, but be able to say, okay, no, I never sold this item. Right. I have yeah. a mistake proof process in place where I have to barcode scan a yeah. 2D barcode in order to, you know, I have this serialized. So it's a power of serialization. But we think about the supply chain for a second. So claims compliance yeah. uh, as one element. So I'm in a factory and I'm scanning items as I pack, you know, these items, put them into a case. Right. Well, that 2D barcode is, you know, can relate to, so I don't need an RFID reader there in order to get the serialization, but I might be reading 
uh, the content of that case without having to open the case Great point. through the supply chain as well. So, Yeah. so I have these different layers of visibility and these really complementary uh, data carriers, be it 2D and RFID. Um, but one more thing is that I think one of the things that we 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 kind of forget about or don't note is in transit theft. So we look at like theft coming out of stores, Yeah. but uh, New York Times had an article a couple months ago uh, showcasing train theft, you know, the, the theft of, you know, people helping themselves to the content of the rail cars. And Wow. it is really substantial. Uh, it is uh, greater than the theft of items coming out of stores. And we, we tend to not think of that because we're like, well, we're focused on the store environment. But when we lock down, we when we have visibility of serialized data going from factory to all the way through the supply chain, well, now we can say, aha, I see that this item uh, was on a you know it went on a train through a shipment, but I never sold it. In fact, it came from this factory, and now I see it entering into um, a secondary market or what have you. And you give consumers the power to detect this. A consumer can point their phone at an item, and that item could potentially say, you know, that that res resolver could say, mm, "I'm not sure this was ever sold. I'm not sure this is a, a legit item." I think you might be buying something that's stolen. And by the way, when that phone is reading that QR code, the brand owner can say, hmm, somebody just interrogated this this tag. That's interesting to me too. So it's it's kind of a, a scary little bit, but exciting as far as you know, how would this be applied? Uh, but the power of serialization and the power of consumers being able to access that serialization and interact with it is uh, is a multiplying effect, I think. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Yeah, which... As a practical example, from a family standpoint, you have capability with your phones right now to go, where is my family? I know where they are at all times. Obviously, they have to share that information with you. And it can be used for detriment or it can be used for harm. But for sure, those kind of use cases. Hey, I, retailer, am looking for 100 pairs of jeans. I, supplier, put 100 pairs of jeans on the truck here's all the serialized items and if you receive them and you didn't get all 100 either you didn't scan them right or somebody in the middle took them i mean that's that's right that's the basis of the auburn chip project right that we worked on for you know years ago and we yeah still yeah we still want to get to that post that is the future of leveraging since we're asking for for the most part suppliers to put things on rfid tags at source leveraging the with the supply chain It's just really, really hard to do, but but it's but it's definitely, I think, the biggest opportunity uh, from an RFID perspective. Now we've gotten the value proposition in the store for the most part, at least Mm got examples where it works. But up that supply chain, I know you're passionate about that as well. Still, seems like we're we're lagging in where we could do from an innovation standpoint, and I'm si excited to be part of it. Me too. Me too, Mike. Yep. Awesome. Uh, there are a lot of exciting things. Uh, we we're just talking about the conferences the last couple of weeks that uh, Yeah. that we've been to, and and uh, exciting developments to see what's happening. To see, uh, for example, major carriers uh, deploying RFID and having continuous visibility throughout their Yep. Uh, supply Yep. chain or, or their value chain or movement chain. And um, what are the implications of that? Mm. You know, greater and greater visibility. So it's a really exciting time for the industry. Um, Auburn University had shared that they had onboarded over 4,000 suppliers in the last three years. It's amazing to think that much growth, that, that many suppliers um, uh, you know, starting up and ramping up with RFID. It shows uh, shows more and more of this this juggernaut, if you will. And I think it Mm requires -hmm. that we take a deeper look at, okay, do we have this right? What As this gets beyond just, uh, you know, maybe 30% of the industry, as it gets to a larger and larger uh, percentage of industry penetration, especially when we have 2D barcodes, how do we ensure that the serialization is
I think you hit all the big points, Mike. I would just share that uh, we have a number. So this has been a major focus uh, for the last several years. Uh, we've had work groups produced some guidelines. Uh, we, we've actually just released uh, some YouTube-based content, you know, a four-part video series that's focused on educating suppliers on mm. how do I get started, food service suppliers. How do I get started with RFID tagging? What right. data do I encode? Where do I put the tag? You know, what are the considerations from a from a physics perspective or, or packaging perspective? How do mm -hmm. I mark tags? Those kind of basic questions to try and go from you know a, a, a thick document that's a standard to something that, that industry can more easily use and and not have to you know go read a you know a couple hundred pages or whatever. And so we've been working hard to build out. Um, these resources as well as case studies and whatnot. I think the industry is, there are a whole lot of quick serve restaurants that are in pilot mode right now. And as well as uh, we see a lot of action with the uh, retail grocery and we want to provide those tool sets. And so that's something that I feel like we are, we're just about there. Like we're probably 90% of there with the, a full kit, a full package, and we'll be a hundred percent there in a, another two months or so, I'd say. Yeah. You saying GS one TikTok? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> that has been that has been stated, but I've never taken that one seriously. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> you really want to watch get industry adoptions? Put it on TikTok. That's I know the right? platform, yeah. right? So, oh my goodness. Well, Jonathan, I can't thank you enough, man. This is uh this is not the first time we've had you on this uh, particular podcast of conversations on retail and the University of Arkansas. Uh, it won't be the last. You you always bring a great industry perspective of this, and without standards and you know real live use cases, uh, this stuff is hard to to really get great at scale. So thank you personally for taking time out of your busy schedule, but thank you for professionally to to educate the industry. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you too. It's great being here. I appreciate it.